Well, we're in part two of our series called Wrapped Up, and I know a lot of you are excited this time of year, and a lot of you feel like that. You feel all wrapped up. One of the things that is, makes Christmas time so exciting for me and always has ever since I was a, a real little kid is the, is the expectation of it all. Just knowing that, that Christmas time was coming up uh, as a kid, knowing there were going to be presents under our Christmas tree, knowing that, that it was going to be exciting and that you know, I, they were going to get lots of good prizes and presents. I was so excited all the time. And, and I expected great things. And my parents, as loving as they were, and did as best they could to, to make that happen. And we were never let down. My brother and I always had a great Christmas presents to be excited about. And we, we, those expectations were definitely uh, fulfilled. And one of the things that changes, though, as you get older, and I, I noticed this uh, when I had my first child, was that you go from, from expecting Christmas to be something that's going to be uh, great for you to, to kind of hoping that you can be the person to fulfill those expectations, to make the expectation of your children or your friends or, or whoever uh, just be great. And, and that's what makes Christmas shopping, Christmas season so difficult for a lot of us is that we're trying to make sure that we meet the expectations of those people that love us and that we love. Uh, and, and we want to give gifts to. Uh, one of the things that, that makes that transition is so difficult is all of these built up expectations. Ex trying to make sure that the people get the gift that they want to get and that you want to make sure that, that they're excited about what you give them. And, and sometimes you get caught up in the expectation of, of, of worry, I guess would be a better way, the worry of who's expecting a gift from you. I know a lot of people are thinking, man, should I get a gift for her? I don't know because it's going to be, you know, is she expecting something from me? Uh, should I get something for, for them, my coworkers or whatever? And, and a lot of times that kind of expectation puts, puts undue stress on, on all of us. By the way, men, just real quick, side note, if your wife or your girlfriend says you don't have to get me anything this year, don't fall for it. It's a trap. <laughs> your warning lights, your spidey senses ought to be going off. Get something. It doesn't have to be something big, but make sure, even if she says don't, that you get at least a little something. So but just my, my, I have a whole theory, a whole philosophy, and we could spend lots of time talking about this. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about uh, at Christmas time other than we're talking about expectations. I have a, a whole theory of expectations. I think a lot of people's um, thoughts or ideas about success or failure are all wrapped up and expectations. Just real quick, just to kind of help you understand what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to talk about sports, and, and we can see it in sports all the time. Um, as a fan of the University of Kentucky, um, you understand this. You guys are, most of you, a lot of you, not all of you I see for certain, I know for certain, are, are Georgia football fans. Imagine if Kentucky and, and Georgia had the I, same exact football records. You don't have to imagine because this year, it happened that way. Both teams had the exact same record in the SEC. Both teams had the exact same record outside of the outside of conference. Their records are the exact same, and, and so because of that, uh, Kentucky fans are, are throwing parties. They're so excited. They couldn't be more thrilled for the season that the team had this year. Started out bad, ended up being okay. So now they're all excited. But I know a lot of Georgia fans are like, man, we got to find us a new coach already. We got to do something. Expectation level changes everything. What we think about expect, and how we expect things to happen changes the way we feel about things. And, and on the flip side of that, um, if, if Georgia's uh, basketball coach takes them to the NCAA tournament once every four or five years, hey, he gets a contract extension. If Kentucky's basketball coach only goes to the tournament once every four or five years, man, he's fired and we're trying to find somebody else. Expect change, expectations can make us have all kinds of great joy or can bring us all kinds of misery. Well, imagine expecting a Savior. Uh, imagine living your entire lives waiting on the Messiah. Well, that was the case about 2,000 years ago when Christ came. And that was the case about 2,000 years before that, beginning with the covenant agreement that God made with, with Abraham. Israel expected a Savior. And they expected a Savior not only because of the agreement that God made with Abraham, but, but going back to hundreds of prophecies talking about this coming Messiah. The nation of Israel was eagerly expecting the Messiah to come. Now, try to put yourself in their shoes. Try to imagine what that would feel like. For some of you, it's kind of difficult to just kind of, um, kind of this existential thing. You've got to go outside yourself. You've got to kind of come to this idea. But, but imagine trying to expect the Savior, waiting for the Messiah to come. What expectations might you have had? I mean, if you're expecting the King of the universe to come and to save your nation, to save your people, what expectations might you have? Would you expect the, the, the King of the universe to come to the temple? 
I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, wouldn't the, wouldn't the king, wouldn't God incarnate come to the temple and, and present himself there? Maybe you would expect the Messiah to come, the Savior to come with, with all kinds of fanfare, like a big party and trumpets and, and all of this stuff, all of these big things going on. You would at least expect, I think that I would have at least expect the Savior of the world to show up first to religious leaders, to the people who had been longing for Him and teaching about Him and all of these things. We would expect God to show up to them first, right? Sort of like a, a rite of passage. I mean, they deserve to see Him. They've been teaching about Him. They've been talking about Him. They were looking for Him. So, so really, if God's going to show Himself to anyone first, it's going to be to the religious leaders, right? But none of these expectations were met. And I think most of you realize that. Most of you have heard this Christmas story enough that you know that's not what happened. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and most of the time, this is what we read when we think about the Christmas story. And again, I mentioned this last week. And if you uh, didn't see last week's message or weren't here last Sunday, you can go uh, to our website and check that out, which is uh, wrapped up in the impossible. We talked about some of that. You can go to our YouTube page as well. Uh, but most of the time when we re think about the Christmas story, and I said this last week, it's, we say this word story sometimes and we, we mean these fictional tales. But this is an actual historic account. This is something that happened a long time ago and was recorded for us to see. So let's begin by reading Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius the, was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And now most of this is what we touched on, at least in, in briefly last week, talking about some of this stuff. How impossible it was for Mary, who was a virgin, to get pregnant. How impossible all of this stuff was. Verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region where there were, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth among those whom, and peace on earth among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at it, what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it has been told to them. The, the shepherds were not expecting this. They, they, their expectations of a Savior were there, but this is not what they were expecting. Uh, this is definitely not what they were expecting. When you, when you go to work, when each of you go to work, you have expectations for that day, right? You know that at, at 1 o'clock this is going to happen, or this day is going to be like this, or you're going to go and do that. Uh, maybe if you work outside, if you, you, know, you look at the weather and you kind of have your expectations, if it's going to be cold, you know you've got to prepare for that or, or whatever. You have expectations for your day. You know what's going to happen. You know if it's going to be busy. You know if it's going to be less so. Well, these shepherds were probably planning on a regular night. I mean, this is not what they were expecting. They were, they were planning on a regular night, working with the sheep, leading them where they needed to be led, doing what, what they needed to do with the, she, with the sheep. I don't really know what all that entails, but I imagine like, you know, saying, hey, sheep, come over here, eat this grass. I don't know if that's right or not. Whatever they had to do. They knew that their night was going to be like a normal night. At least that's what they expected. They had no expectation that, that something was about to happen that would not only change their lives, but change the lives of every person that would ever live from that moment forward. And one thing I want to mention just briefly before we go in too much into the shepherds is, is to think about the 
likely unmet expectations. Now, the shepherds weren't expecting this at all, but what about the people who had their expectations that weren't met? The expectations, likely the expectations of the religious elite. If they assumed, as we probably would here, and as we probably would have then, that they would be the first to know, they would have had a hard time accepting Jesus as the Messiah. Their expectations weren't met. This Messiah that they thought would come in were probably thinking that we're going to be the first to know. When that didn't happen, from that moment forward, they would have a difficult time understanding or believing that Jesus is the Messiah. And as we see, as you move forward in Scripture, you find out that that is exactly the case. He didn't come to them in the way that they expected, so he can't be him. Which leads to another surprise. Something that wasn't expected at all, at least in my mind, and I think probably if we had been there, we would have not expected this either. The, we would not have expected the irony of the simplicity of the whole scene. How amazing is this, that God of the universe, the creator of all things, came to a manger. And the only invited guests were not the king or the governor, not royalty of any kind. The only invited guests were lowly shepherds. And we would expect, I would expect at least, the, the creator of all life, the eternal one, the God who created all things and by all things sustains life through all things and in all things. If he came to earth, my expectation would be that he would be put up in the nicest hotel and have the most famous of guests. They had been expecting this for years. And this is how God comes into the world in a manger. God's ways are certainly different than our ways. Martin Luther, the, the great reformer, once said this in a sermon, Shame on you, wretched Bethlehem. The inn ought to have been burned with brimstone. How can there be no room for God in your inn? I remember my dad, is a, my dad was a salesman, has always been a salesman. We, I remember him traveling a whole lot and him going with him a few times on his business things. And it wasn't like uh, today where, you know, you go online and you, you, you get your hotel and you say, you know, I want this room with that type of bed and click, click, click. And it's, you know, here's your, here's your cost. My dad would always go to the hotel and say, hey, I need a room for tonight. What's your best rate? You know, they would say $60 or whatever. It was a long time ago. And um, he would say, how about I give you 30 and they would do this kind of back and forth, and my dad would always end up getting a good deal, always. I remember one time, he, him going to a place, and, and I was with him, and he said, hey, I need a room. And, and they said, hey, we're all booked up. And he said, oh, you're all booked up? That's crazy. I, you know, it must be busy, whatever. He said, are you telling me that if the President of the United States showed up, that you would tell him he can't stay here? And they say, no, no, no. I mean, if the pre we always have one aside that for, you know, special occasions. And he said, do you think the president's going to be here tonight? And she said, no. And he said, well, then let me have that room. <laughs> There's always room, right? Can you imagine if the God of the and that's a true story. My dad did that several times. Um, you, by the way, you guys will get a chance to meet him. You can ask him about that next week. He'll be here. Um, can you imagine the God of the universe coming to an end and saying, them saying, no, we don't have room for God. And so many of us, it's kind of a, a metaphor for our lives, right? I mean, we don't have room for God. And my, my favorite part of this whole scene where we see uh, the shepherds here is, is when the angels show up. And, and you see this every time you see angels show up. The first words out of their mouths aren't, hey, shepherds, or hey, Billy, or Bobby, or whatever their shepherds' names are. Hey, guys, look at us. That's, that's never the angels' first words. The angels' first words are always, fear not. Every time you see an encounter with an angel, the angel says, fear not. You know why? Because when you see an angel face to face, it's scary. It's not like angels we think of, like your grandma has those little figurines on her, on her uh, mantle at home. And you know, they're, they've got the harp and they've got the little belly and they're so cute with the wings and all that. That's not the, these are not how angels are depicted in Scripture. When you come into the presence of an angel, when you come into the presence of the glory of God, it's scary. Because you see God's holiness and you see your own sinfulness. You see that God is so much bigger than we think and so much more powerful and holy than us. And the angels told them that, that, that their expectations for a coming Messiah have been realized. That thing that you have been waiting for your whole life, that people have been telling you about, that they waited for their whole life and their fathers, their whole lives, that thing is coming now. A Savior has been born in Bethlehem. 
And after the birth announcement, after they uh, let the shepherds know this is what's happening, this is what's going on, a heavenly host of angels appear and they sing praises to God. Which only makes sense. Because the coming of Jesus is a cause for praise. You know, so much at Christmas time we forget that. So often we, we forget that. We have these expectations of what's going on in our lives. We have the, to meet the expectations of our party going. We have to meet the expectations of, our, our, of inviting our guests. We have to meet the expectations of our, of our meals, or our preparation, our presence. We have all of this stuff that gets us so wrapped up that we forget to step back and look at what God has done for us, that He came in the form of Jesus, and that's a time for praise. In Christ's physical birth, God's plan of defeating His enemies is coming to fruition. His plan is working. And so the shepherds, after hearing this from the angels, they traveled to Bethlehem. They found this young family that, that the angels told them about. And then they told Mary and Joseph all that happened to them. Hey, we were, can you imagine? Hey, you know, we had these angels come to us and they told us there's going to be a baby lying in a manger. And I imagine some of the shepherds being like, what? That's crazy. Why would a baby be in a manger? That doesn't make sense. We're not going to find that. And then when they did, they had to say, this is the one. And after they told Mary and Joseph all about it, the, the shepherds left and they began praising God. Their night was not what they were expecting. And when your expectations are blown away, you tell people. When your expectations aren't met on the flip side of that, you tell people about that as well. But the shepherds had their expectations blown away. It stayed with them everywhere they went. I imagine them singing the praises of God and what they saw. I remember a couple specific Christmas presents in my life that stuck with me like that. When I was about 13 or so, my, my mom and dad uh, bought me a, a TV. Man, it was 19 inches it was color. I loved it. I put it in my room, but they actually put a cable in there, which, you know, in hindsight probably wasn't the best of ideas, but I thought it was great at the time. And I thought, man, I've got my own TV. I couldn't wait to go tell my buddy next door. And before long, everybody in the neighborhood knew that I had my own TV in my room. It was one of the big ones, too. Not the little 13 inch, but it was 19 inches. Still had the dial, like, chicka, 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 you know, but, I, but if I put it on channel three, we had the cable box and I had the, the cable thing. Man, the remote worked and everything. It was, it was awesome. Maybe the next year or maybe the year prior, I can't remember, <clears throat> my brother and I together, they gave, my, my mom and dad gave us this present together. Like, we, you know, it was a present to both of us. It was a Nintendo Entertainment System, the old school one, man. You guys know what I'm talking about. They just, they just did a re-up one. I don't know if you saw the, the Nintendo Classic came out. I want that thing so bad. It is, it is 60 bucks only. It was, I think when mom and dad bought this Nintendo, it was probably 200 bucks. And man, we told the, everybody. It was the one where you had to get the cartridge, you know, you put it in and had to blow it out before you had to get it to work. How many, how many of you remember that? Am I, oh, oh yeah, good, good. I'm good. Man, I, I, I couldn't wait to tell. We stayed up all night for the next you know, few couple weeks until we had to go back to school playing Nintendo. We lived in, in Florida, right outside of Tampa at the time. And, um, a very diverse area, not, not unlike Snellville where we lived, and, um, although most of the diversity was Hispanic. And so um, the, um, one of the, a couple of the kids from down the street had just moved, moved into our neighborhood from Puerto Rico, and they didn't hardly speak English at all. But they would knock on the door, <clears throat> and when we would go to the door, they'd say, play, play, come on in, we go play Nintendo. Everybody knew, right? So the whole neighborhood knew. Because, we, because our expectations were blown away. And when your expectations are blown away, you tell people. And we aren't told, but I imagine the shepherds going and telling everyone they came into contact with about this good news of great joy that the king of the universe has been born. The Messiah they've been longing for is there. I imagine they went home and their wives woke up the next morning and whenever they got home and, and, and their wife was like, hey, work all right? It was crazy, let me tell you about it. And now, 2,000 years later, we have our own Christian expectations of the Messiah. And some of our expectations of Jesus are, are misplaced. Some of our expectations of Jesus aren't what we think they ought to be or aren't where we should have them. 
We expect, so many of us expect that because we're Christians, because we put our faith in Jesus, because we trust in Jesus, that, 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 that Christ is going to make us happy. When we have these expectations of Christ. He was born in a manger. He came to us. I, my life is going to be happy. From here on out, I've put my trust in Jesus. I'm following him. My life is going to be good. I think probably the number one misplaced expectations of Christian is that. That when I begin following Jesus, my life will be happy from that point forward. And then when our expectation of happiness isn't met, when we, when we struggle, right? When our lives go bad, when we're thinking, man, this is not what I expected when I became a follower of Christ. We kind of blame God sometimes. Or we blame Jesus. And I, I followed him thinking that I would get happiness, that my life would be hunky-dory from, from this point forward. But it's not. Because our happiness isn't God's number one concern. I think God wants that for us. I think God desires that for us, but that's certainly not his number one concern. It's not why Christ was born in the manger. Same thing with our expectation of, of our life being better or our life being more comfortable or our life being easy. That if we just follow Jesus, then my expectation is that my life is going to be easy. Again, all of those things are nice, but those things are not why God became a man in that stinky shelter. On that first Christmas. In fact, Jesus even tells us not to have those types of expectations. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said this, I have said these things to you that in me you, have, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. John 15, 18 and 19 says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. This is Jesus saying, look, it's not going to be. It's not, don't expect those things. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I think we need to rethink our expectations for ourselves in following Jesus. We're not always going to have a, a happy life. Our lives aren't always going to be easy or comfortable. And this is a, a very um, contextualized thought, right? I mean, I'm not going to go to talk to the, the Christians there in, in Syria and, and have to tell them this. Don't expect following Jesus is going to make your life easy. That's not, they already know that, right? But we struggle with this because we are so incredibly blessed that our expectations of the Messiah change. We need to rethink those things. The Messiah wasn't born in the manger so that we can kick back and relax and enjoy our life. He was born in a manger so that we could be saved from our sins. That's why he came. Christmas is all about that. Christmas is all about God chasing after us despite our sin and, and making a way for us to be united with him. I think not only are some of our expectations not met, but I think also some of the expectations that we do have, we don't give enough weight to. Some of the expectations that we do have of following Christ will be so incredibly surpassed that we can't even begin to understand. I think most of us as Christians have a, an expectation of heaven. We have an expectation of life eternal with God. Uh, but the truth of that matter, whatever it is you think about that, man, our expectations are going to be blown away when we come into the presence of God forever. It's so much more than, than so many people think about floating on clouds or, you know, playing your harp forever and ever. That's not, that's not it. It's, it's no sin, no pain, no suffering, no crying, none of the things of this world that bring us down. Life eternal with God as He meant it to be from the beginning. That's what heaven is. I think, too, we don't give enough weight to Satan's defeat. We can give Satan too much credit Satan is powerful for sure, but, but he's already been defeated. He, God came in the manger and then he died on the cross defeating Satan. If you're a Christian here this morning, you don't have to give in to temptation. You don't have to experience defeat in your life as in your pursuit of holiness. God has already won those things. The victory is his. One surprising twist in this story the story of Jesus and the manger and the shepherds being the, the first to meet Jesus is that 
is that Jesus comes to the lonely and despised. Jesus came in a manger, and I don't think anyone expected that. Jesus comes to the humble. Jesus comes to the down and out. Jesus comes to the outcasts of society, to those who need healing and salvation. Christ came for everyone, to be sure, but, but only those willing to humble themselves and admit their need for a Savior will actually receive this blessed gift. Again, Martin Luther said this about Jesus' birth and then later about His return. He said, If Christ had arrived with trumpets and laying in a cradle of gold, His birth would have been a splendid affair. But it would be, not be a comfort to me. He was rather to lie in the lap of a poor maiden and be thought of little significance in the eyes of the world. Now I can come to Him. Now He reveals Himself to the miserable in order not to, to give any impression that He arrives with great power, splendor, wisdom, and a Christic, aristotic, I'm not even going to say that right, aristocratic manners. The, the idea is that the lowliness of the manger makes salvation accessible to those of us who are low. If you have sin in your life, if you're, if, if you're rejected by God because of your sin, you're, you're embraced by God when you follow the one who came for the lowly, Christ Jesus. Luther continues. He says this, but upon his return on that day, we're talking about when Christ comes again, when he will oppose the high and mighty, it will be different. Now he comes to the poor who need a Savior, but then he will come as a judge against those who are persecuting him now. And this is what the birth of Jesus was all about. And that's the message of Christmas, the hope of Jesus, hope for the hopeless, justice for the oppressed, lifting up the humble, embracing the outcast, a Savior for those who need it. I need it. My sins have alienated me from God, and because of God's grace, He sent a way for me to be saved. All of us in truth need it. And that is the story of Christmas. God loves us so much that He came to us to rescue us from ourselves. In a moment, we're going to sing a song, and it's going to be a time of invitation, a time of reflection, a time for you to think about what God is saying to you in this moment as you maybe are so wrapped up in this Christmas season that you uh, get constrained like Aaron in the video where you feel like you have nowhere else to go. But my prayer is that each and every one of you will recognize the Savior. Recognize that God came in the lowliest of manners for the lowliest of people. Those who humble themselves and recognize their need. God is for us. And if you haven't given your life to following Jesus, then I pray that today would be the day that you do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Father, thank you for coming to save us, to rescue us. Father, I know that I need it. And so many people here have, have recognized that need in their own lives. Father, I pray if there's anyone here that they would as well. We need you. And you knew that. So you came to us in the form of Jesus. Father, help us to have right expectations about what that means. Help us to continue to long for and to expect your second coming, knowing that you will finally come one day to make all things right. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.